first off, thanks for inviting me and having me. So the title of the talk is The Living Bodies Embodied Lives, Francisco Varela's Path from Life to Experience and Back Again. Okay, uh, I would like to start my talk uh, with a quote um, by famous Austrian philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein. Uh, a quote which Francisco Varela, who, as was probably clear from the title, will be the central subject matter of this talk, was very fond of referencing in his earlier texts. This is um, how it reads. What we are supplying are really remarks on the natural history of man, not curiosities, however, but rather observations on facts which no one has doubted and which have only gone unremarked because they are always before our eyes. So this particular quote, the reason why I'm mentioning it here, touches upon a recurrent theme in Francisco Varela's work, and that is the theme of the blind spots. So of the fact that we are very often blind to the things that are not eccentric or extravagant, but precisely those that are most familiar and commonplace, precisely those that we are constantly in front of us, those that we are in touch with. Okay, so what does this have to do with what I'm going to talk about today? I think it is safe to say that we are currently amidst what might be called at least a little revolution, an e-revolution in cognitive science and beyond. So after the, public, uh, after the publication of the cla now classical text, The Embodied Mind by Varela, Thompson and Roche in 1991, we have witnessed a uh, proliferation of so-called 4E approaches to mind and cognition. Now, these are approaches that are very different, but do have something in common, namely the idea that mind and cognition have to be construed as embodied, enacted, embedded, and extended. Currently, we're actually witnessing even more ease hopping on this hot bandwagon. Uh, so people are now also talking about mind and cognition being ecological, being emotive, being experiential, evolutionary, and so on and so forth. So, I think it would be, again, safe to say that words like inaction, embodiment, and words like, for instance, lived experience are now becoming staple, perhaps even buzzwords in cognitive science, philosophy of mind, and similar uh, uh, fields. They have, they are slowly becoming widespread adoption and acquiring widespread adoption and many people uh, seem to be very much willing to present their work as being in that particular camp. However, as it's often the case, the optic in this interest and in this popularity of the words uh, is at the same time followed by a certain erosion, or maybe we could say dilution of the meaning of these words. These are becoming seemingly straightforward, but it's far, it, it is far from clear that this is in fact the case. That this, is the, that this is so, so that these things, although they are becoming more and more prevalent, more and more widespread, uh, are somehow becoming also very much diluted with regards to what is it actually that they are referring to, uh, uh, is shown by several pap papers that have been published recently and which are challenging the university, uh, the uniformity of some of these approaches. So these papers are all pointing out certain important differences, perhaps even serious discrepancies between such approaches. Um, just to illustrate this matter, let us take a look at two recent, relatively recent examples. The first example is um, a review, a very critical review written by Evan Thompson of Hutto and Mines 2017 book involving an activism. And uh, it's a very, very interesting review. I warmly recommend you read it. Uh, but here are two fragments from this particular uh, uh, text. My final comments concerning Hutu and Mines' use of the term inactive. Uh, my final comments concern Hutu and Mines' use of the term inactive. They do not define or explain the word. They use it loosely and liberally to refer to a cluster of ideas. The price to pay for using the word in this vague way is philosophical and scientific imprecision. 
And the review ends with the following uh, sentence. It has no bearing on the inactive approach defined properly. So it is not my intention here to really examine on the nuances of Evan Thompson's critique, although I have to admit that I'm generally sympathetic to its main thrust. I would, however, like to point out Thompson's insistence that an action and an activism have become not only vague and loose, but also, we might say, anemic and watered down. Now, here's the second example. And here, the central point that the author, here Sean Gallagher, is trying to make is visible from the very title of the text. The, the, the text is called The Invasion of the Body Snatchers. How embodied cognition is being disembodied. Uh, yet again, a, a, a quote from the text. I want to focus, says Gallagher, on some theorists who I'll call the body snatchers because, because in some real sense they devise a version of embodied cognition that leaves the body out of it. Since for them, all the essential actions occur in the brain. In effect, body snatchers have invaded theories of embodied cognition and have replaced bodies with sanitized body formatted representations in the brain. So, in general, we have a similar idea, namely that we are witnessing what Gallagher calls sanitizations, or we might call it domestification of embodiment. So, the body simply becomes translated into body representations in the brain. If we summarize the main thrust of these two critiques, we could say that words like inaction, embodiment, lived experience are indeed witnessing an increase po in popularity, but this is correlated with the uh, decrease in understanding. That is to say, not all inactions are alike and the embodiment, the embodiment is not the same as embodiment, at least not always. So what do these words signify? signify? How do they fit together? This is what brings me to the main or central aim or topic of my current talk. I will here focus on one important strand in this story, and this is something that I would like to refer as the Varelian heritage. Uh, the main point behind my talk is that many of these notions, many of these ideas, were first introduced into cognitive science by the Chilean biologist, cognitive scientist, and philosopher Francisco Varela, whom no doubt you have all probably have heard of. Um, and to understand these notions, to understand these ideas, is in my view, it is important, in my view, to understand the larger philosophical project in which they emerged. That is to say, it is important to revisit what problems these ideas were trying to solve and why and how they were supposed to solve them. Now, I'm not here claiming that this is the only true, proper, and so on and so forth understanding of an action, embodiment, and lived experience. However, I do feel that if we understand this broader concept, uh, th this broader project, if we understand this broader horizon in which they emerged, this can give us a better sense of the directionality, orientation, and the poignancy, significance, importance of these notions. So this is the provisional itinerary for my talk. First, I will try to sketch or outline a broader philosophical horizon that I've mentioned which can briefly be summarized as uh, an attempt to overcome Cartesianism, and I will explain what, is what, what, it, what specifically I mean by that, um, and replace it by a different thought style, by a novel non-dual mode of thought, which Francisco Varela in his early works calls participatory epistemology or epistemology of participation. And then I would like to highlight the central role of the phenomenon of life in this broader project. So how the phenomenon of life enters this picture and why Francisco Varela found it integral for this overcoming of Cartesianism and establishment of alternative uh, style of thought. And I will here present two aspects of the phenomenon of life, namely its Janus-faced and Uroboric nature. And I will try to show why this is significant for 
a better understanding of notions such as inaction, embodiment, and so on and so forth. Okay, so let us start with the first part. And here again, I would like to start with a short quote. This one, th this time, a quote taken from one of uh, Francesco, Francisco Varela's uh, early texts, Reflections on the Chilean Civil War. This is what Varela has to say. You see, my basic bias, my fundamental narrow-mindedness, is that I don't believe that we can talk about a worldview without at the same time observing and critically examining how did these ideas, so the ideas that constitute the worldview, come about. No content should be divorced from the context in which it has been produced. This goes under the name of epistemology, and so I would like to do a little epistemology. And in a certain sense, my whole talk will be an exercise in a little of epistemology. So, Francisco Varela, as you know, he was primarily a scientist, but he was a scientist with acute philosophical sensibilities. So, he was very much aware that notions, ideas, theories, and so on, do not evolve in a vacuum. They do not fall out of the sky. They always emerge against a specific ideational horizon, a specific ideational background, and to understand them, to understand their meaning, it is not enough to just understand their content, but also the context that provides a broader, meaningful horizon for these ideas, notions, and so on and so forth. Uh, this is what Varela meant by epistemology and why he finds it so important and why he's constantly emphasizing that he is, in many ways, an epistemologist. Now, this same observation holds true for Francisco Varela's own ideas as well. And in the preface to the Machinas y Seres Vivos on Machines and the Living Beings, Francisco Varela refers specifically to autopoiesis, that autopoiesis has to be understood against the broader background, but it's also true for inaction and embodiment. So again, these notions have not fallen out of the sky, but have emerged against a larger, what Francisco Varela refers to as trend or mood or a specific orientation or a background of tendencies that were characteristic of the period in which they were forged. Now, for Varela, this particular period, this period in question when the, these ideas started to form, could be described as one of transition. So it is a period of recontextualization. More specifically, it is a period of a shift or a change from one prevailing context to another. Even more specifically, it is a period characterized by a slow progressive fading of Cartesianism, which characterizes a very specific and specifically dualist mode of thought, and the emergence of what he calls, in the earlier text again, participatory mode of thought, which is supposed to be inherently non-dualist. So, again, if we want to understand Varela's ideas, uh, among them ideas like an action and embodiment, it is really important to understand this, the significance of this transition, the significance of these, this recontextualization. Okay, so let me start with the idea of Cartesianism. What is this fading context that uh, um, Francisco Varela was very often extremely critical of, and he saw himself as being one of the contributing factors of its uh, downfall or demise. So Cartesianism, Francisco Varela uses a lot of different names. I'm using this one for sheer simplicity, and it's perhaps not even the best one because it is not limited, of course, strictly and solely to the, the uh, uh, Descartes' thought, even though this is where it acquires its name, but it is referring to a broader ideational context, a specific mode or style of thought that has emerged in the 16th to 18th century with the birth of modern philosophy and modern science. So this particular style of thought, but by the way, what do I mean by style of thought? Style of thought or, or thought style, is a term taken or borrowed from uh, um, Polish and Jewish uh, microbiologist and philosopher of science, Ludwig Fleck, 
basically refers to the most general or fundamental way of how we cope with the world, of how we cognitively engage with phenomena. And when I say cognitively, I don't mean cognitively only in the narrow sense, so something that pertains to thinking, to thought, but also uh, something that is much more broader, so also pertains um, to, say, our behavioral, perceptual, linguistic, even emotive, affective mode of engaging with, spe with specific, specific phenomena. So a very fundamental, basic attitude, attitude or orientation to the world. And in this particular time period, between 16th and 18th century, a very distinct, a very specific thought style has emerged, which is uh, which has many different characteristics, and out of all of them, I would like to focus on three. And mind you, these have become so habitual that we are very much blind to them. So we are again here talking about the blind spots. We are in many ways heirs to this particular thought style. So what are these three characteristics that, like, that I would like to point out? And soon we will see why they are so important. The first one is mathematization. This is the idea that the world and phenomena can be exhaustively accounted for or explicated in formal slash mathematical terms. The second characteristic is mechanization. So this idea that the world and phenomena in the world are construed as machines. This, in other words, means that they ultimately consist of discrete, that is to say separate individual parts, which are causally interrelated and the capacity to understand them in these terms exhaustively explains the nature of these phenomena and finally there is the idea of depersonalization characteristic of depersonalization a slightly awkward term perhaps but the main thrust should be relatively clear it is the idea that to know actually means to exclude the knower that is to say to exclude everything knower or observer related. Fundamentally, this is the idea of the view from nowhere that you must have heard of. It is a phrase popularized by philosopher Nagel. Now, this particular thought style has had immense theoretical, practical and the uh, technological success. And again, I would like to remind you that in very many ways, we are all heirs to this thought style, even though perhaps you might be on a principled level um, opposed to it or find many issues with it, it is something that is very much permeated, uh, that very much permeates the, the, the very fundamental ways we do in fact cope or engage with the world. So it has had immense successes, but it has also had grave issues accompanying it from the very beginning. Above all, there are phenomena that cannot be accounted for in this particular manner. So not only do we find here phenomena such as colors, smells, textures, and so on and so forth, but also, and even more importantly, phenomena such as values, norms, and meanings. None of them can be mathematized, uh, um, um, what do you, what's the proper word, Mecha mechanized and uh, approached in a completely depersonalized, de-observable manner. The ultimate result of all of this is the, the infamous bifurcation of nature, which is a phrase coined by the American philosopher Alfred North Whitehead. That is to say, bifurcation means that we end up with two incommensurable realities, two incommensurable domains. On the one hand, we have the domain of experience, which is populated with all the phenomena that do not fit into the category of uh, mathematization, mechanization, depersonalization. Now, these are phenomena that are immediately given to us, that are immediately accessible to us. These are the phenomena among which we live. They constitute and populate our Lebenswelt, our life world. This is the uh, texture of our experiential world. But they are accessible, but they are illusory. On the other hand, we have 
domain of nature, narrowly construed, which consists of phenomena that do in fact fit this particular mode. And these phenomena are deemed to be real. These are the domina that are the phenomena that are subject of proper knowledge and proper knowing, but they are never given, they are never accessible. The ultimate structure, ultimate geometrical mechanical structure of the world is never given to you immediately. It is never accessible directly. It is always given indirectly via concepts, th theories and models. So, in other words, we end up with this infamous split, as I've said, between the subjective internal on the one hand and the objective external on the other hand. Or to phrase it more philosophically, the domain of experience is the domain of interiority without exteriority, and the domain of nature is exteriority without interiority. Now, the biggest problem here is that the gap between these two domain, domains is unbridgeable in principle. So we, are, we end up with the an insurmountable split with the insurmountable bifurcation between the real with what is external and the lived, that is to say, internal. And this, of course, leads to a very profound and uh, uh, epistemological and existential predicament. So it is not only an intellectual problem. We ourselves live in a world that is in many ways schizophrenic. It is split into two. You live in a specific world of your own experience, which is illusory, and at the same time, there is the world of your knowing, which is inaccessible, in which you cannot, in principle, live. So, why am I talking about schizophrenia? Because I'm using the term literally. So, uh, schizophrenia as the split-mindedness or two-mindedness. So, uh, as a reference, precisely, of living in these two domains. Okay, so according to Varela, this particular split, this particular bifurcation cannot be mended on the cheap, if we use the famous phrase by Chalmers. So the solution to the problem will not be found on the level of the content, but on the level of the context. In other words, it cannot be solved or mended directly, or as Francisco Varela puts it in his text on neurophenomenology, by simply adding some theoretical fix or conceptual solution, but from the side, sideways, that is to say, only through a specific recontextualization. So the idea to solve the problem that I've just described is by dissolving it. Now, this is a very crucial and important step, so I would like to delve a little bit on it, okay? What do I mean by not solving it directly, but by solving it, that is to say, dissolving it from the side. So whenever we are faced with a problem, whenever we are looking for a solution to a certain problem, this can be done in at least two separate ways. The first way is by trying to solve the problem directly. Here you basically try to find an answer to the problem. And this means that you've accepted the ideational framework, the ideational context within which the problem has appeared. Here, we might say the problem is tamed, it is resolved. However, there is another way of solving a problem. You don't try to solve it directly, but you try to solve it from the side, sideways. So here, you're not trying to find a res resolution, an answer, but you try to dissolve the problem. What do I mean by that? Instead of accepting the ideational framework within which the problem emerged, you try to thematize and problematize and ultimately replace the ideational work framework or context within which it has emerged. Here, the problem is not tamed, it is not resolved, but ultimately it's supposed to fall away, it dissol dissolves. So, to give you a trivial example, say you're faced with a problem how to get rich. Okay, the direct way of solving the problem would be designing a series of steps that you have to do to attain this goal. The indirect way of solving the problem would be to problematize the framework within the, which this became a problem to you. 
Is this really something that you want to dedicate your life to? This is not to say that a certain amount of wealth is not needed for other aspects of life, but just that once you reshuffle, once you reframe the problem, once you recontextualize it, it acquires a completely different meaning, a completely different directionality. And now, of course, both of these approaches can be valid. I'm not trying to say that you have to solve all the problems from the side. Uh, and this, of course, depends on the circumstances and the nature of the problem. For instance, if somebody says, jump, yeah, uh, and uh, uh, if, if it's because there's a tiger in front of you, you might very well do that. Uh, you would be very smart to actually, in fact, listen to this and, and jump. So you accept the problem and you find a solution. But if somebody has been telling you jump for 20 years and you've been jumping in your place up and down, you know, maybe you should really kind of reconsider, rethink uh, how you're spending your life. Now, why is this important to get back to the, to the original problem? For Varela, when it comes to this duality, to this bifurcation that I've uh, described between experience and nature, head-on direct approaches have proven to be unsatisfactory. So the conceptual space seems to have been exhausted. And philosophy of mind and scientists seem to simply oscillate between the same solutions in different guises, from physicalism through dualism, idealism, and back again. So the way Francisco tries to solve this is not head-on, not directly, but from the side. So in a certain sense, he's trying to pull the rug underneath the problem. Again, he's trying to solve it by dissolving it. And this means nothing less than trying to erect a new ideational context, a new thought style. Now, Francisco Varela, in his texts use different names for this, but in his earlier text, he used the, the, the phrase, which I have mentioned now on several occasions, and that is the epistemology of participation. In his uh, book from the late 70s, Principles of Biological Autonomy, he says, we have to build upon a style of thinking where description of a certain something reveals the properties of the observer rather than obscuring them. The epistemology of participation sees man in continuity with natural world while seeing nature as human history. So as you can see already from the name itself, there is a certain participatory integrative character that Francisco Varela is trying to underline. So he's trying to contribute to the development of this particular thought style. And this is something that he doesn't feel he's just kind of making up on the spot. Quite the contrary. For him, this transformation, this transmutation is already underway and it's happening both within science. He Here he is very often referring to quantum mechanics and above all dynamic systems theory as good representatives of this particular change. And also outside of science, here he is referring to many philosophical schools, such as phenomenology, Lebensphilosophy, historic, uh, French historical epistemology. And Francisco Varela simply sees himself as contributing to this orientation and to spell out some of the implications of this shift. Now, the main idea behind this sideways approach, behind this novel development of novel thought style is the following. Instead of starting with the separate domains and then trying to find a fix or glue in one way or another to put them back together, what needs to happen is something more akin to a gestalt switch. Now, gestalt switch switches, these shifts in our gestalt uh, perception are interesting because in a certain sense, nothing happens in them, yet everything happens. So nothing is added, nothing is taken away, yet at the same time, the overall structure, the overall meaning is completely changed. So if we look at this particular and very famous example of uh, Rubin's uh, Gestalt faces versus vase, when you do perform the Gestalt switch from two faces to a vase, you haven't added anything, you haven't taken away anything from the material that is given to you, yet at the same time, the whole, the gestalt itself, is completely different. So you move, interestingly enough, 
from two entities, two separate faces looking at each other through a certain chasm to a vase, which is a unified structure and is something that represents a unified whole, you might say. Now for Francisco, something similar has to happen when we're approaching this particular problem. And this is what he means by facing it from the side. So the way we see and think about nature and experience should be in a way where they both acquire a radically different meaning, where we are not faced with a bifurcation, but actually with a mutual encroachment. So they in it, in, interpenetrate and they interweave uh, in and through this change of the, the, the perspective. So exteriority and inter interiority become, as I said, interwoven. Uh, towards the end of the talk, I will be talking about science having to become a mode of experience and uh, experience something that strives towards expression or knowledge. And this is also the reason why in Francisco you will find a lot of new symbols, a lot of new metaphors to, to express this uh, shift. Symbols like Uroboros, this uh, ancient uh, mythological snake that is devouring its own tail, or the Mubius strip, the, the, the ge geometrical structure where you have this ongoing shift from exteriority to interiority and uh, back again. Now, before we continue, and this should be probably obvious, but still it needs to be emphasized, Francisco Varela was by no means anti-science. What he was interested in is in what could be called a transformed science, science with a new face. Now, why am I saying science with a new face? Because in my native tongue, Slovene, transformation translates as preobrazba, and this literally means change of face, acquiring a new face. And towards the end of the talk, I will be talking about reflexive science as a maybe cumbersome name for this alternative, different type of science. What I would still, uh, what I would like to underscore here uh, also is that Francisco was working on the three dimensions that I mentioned before throughout his um, life. So he did not try to shove them away. What he did try to is develop ways where we could see them differently, where they could be productively changed, where they could undergo a gestalt switch. So in his earlier years, he was working on new formal tools. He was working on what he called arithmetic of closure, cl calculus of self-reference. These are different arithmetical models that would be able to account for self-referentiality and similar ideas and similar notions. And then he was constantly developing new scientific models and new scientific metaphors, metaphors and models such as autopoiesis, autonomy, embodiment and action, precisely to kind of capture this shift. And finally, he was, as you know, developing specific, specific concrete first person methods of working with lived experience. Uh, and he was working on that in the context of neurophenomenology, first person research and so on and so forth. But there is one crucial thing, one crucial point that is lacking. Namely, how do we go about triggering this Gestalt switch? How do we go about evoking this change in the thought style, this change in the context within which these phenomena appear to us? And this is where the second part of the talk enters, and that is through the phenomenon of life. So for Francisco Varela, it is life or vitality that is crucial in the story if we want to initiate this particular uh, transformation. Now, why exactly life? Why vitality? Life in Cartesianism, as you probably all know, is usually relegated to the domain of the objective, the external. It is understood as a sophisticated machine. However, life has always had difficult, it was very, very, very difficult to keep it there. If, uh, and this is very nicely shown in this slightly, in a, in a very um, evocative, but also maybe slightly uh, exaggerated quote by uh, Henri Bergson. In vain, we force the living into this or that one of our molds, all the molds crack. 
So in the beginning of the 20th century, there was a revitalization of interest in, in life uh, and vitality. There was a revitalization of interest in organisms and organic wholes in living bodies and corporeal existence. Now, why would this be the case? Because many philosophers and some scientists saw life as the phenomenon with the potential to transgress these clear-cut boundaries between external exteriority and interiority, between nature construed as exteriority without interiority and between experience as the domain of interiority without exteriority. Now, why would life be capable of doing this? According to Varela, who was part of this trend or part of this movement of thinkers who saw life as potentially initiating this shift, this can be for at least two reasons. First reason is because life is Janus faced, and the second reason is because it is circular in nature. Now, let me explain what I mean by these two terms, starting with Janus faced. Why? Is life Janus faced? What does that even mean? Here, of course, I'm referring to Janus, the Roman god of beginnings and endings, transitions, passageways, and so on and so forth. Janus is characterized by having two faces, which are looking in the opposite direction, but are joined in, 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 between, in, in the middle. So this Janus faced nature, two faced nature, you might say, of life is already sedimented in our speech. And here I would like to um, um, bring your attention to the um, what Fr French phenomenologist Barbara says about the verb vivre. He says that the verb vivre designates both to live on the one hand and to experience on the other hand. So vivre means both to live and to experience. In other words, to live or vivre refers both to living beings, to organisms, and to lived being, aliveness or a sense of aliveness. In yet other terms, on the very terminological level already, we find this duality or dual facedness between life referring to both living bodies, so exterior phenomena, phenomena given in the world, and to lived bodies, so bodies as experienced, as lived. So this is the Janus faced part of the story. And for Francisco Varela, this Janus faced nature is related to life's inherent circularity. He uses several different terms here, reflexivity, recursion, and so on and so forth. But the crucial thing is that for Varela, this is not something that would be contradictory, but something that would be essential to life. So life, we could say, is a Mubius strip incarnate. And this is very nicely expressed in one of Francisco Varela's earlier texts called Your Inside is Out and Your Outside is In. So again, for Francisco Varela, in the phenomenon of life, interiority and exteriority intermesh and encroach. And this circular nature can be found regardless of where we start. If we start with living bodies, with organisms, or if we start with lived bodies, or with our own experiential field. Now, let me briefly try to show why and how this is the case. This is going to be slightly schematic, but it shouldn't be a problem because I'm sure that you're all familiar with this. So the main point is that regardless of where you start, if you start with living beings as phenomena given in the world, or if you start with living beings as that which you yourself live, you will find this circularity, you would find this encroachment. Okay. So let us start with life as living. So life as uh, uh, living bodies. As you know, informed by developments in cybernetics and especially dynamic systems theory, Francisco Varela construed living beings not as heteronomous, that is to say other governed systems, but rather as autonomous self-governed systems. More specifically for Francisco Varela, Living beings are not input-output systems. They are not machine-like conglomerates governed by external stimuli. 
Instead, they are self-producing systems. They are dynamic self-organizing wholes that maintain uh, to uh, that, that, that try to maintain their internal coherence, their dynamic equilibrium. If we simplify this a little bit, we could say that autonomous systems are characterized by a circular process whereby parts and the whole co-specify or co-determine each other. Okay, and this is most clearly, more simply shown on the example of a single cell. As you know, for Francisco Varela, single cells are autopoietic units which literally means, autopoiesis literally means self-producing units. And what we have here, when we have an autopoietic system, we have a circular relation between parts, here this specifically means complex network of metabolic processes, and the whole. That is to say, cell seen as a separate, delineated, membrane-bound unit. This circularity, again, if we oversimplify, can be articulated as follows. Metabolic processes produce the membrane, which allows the metabolic processes to unfold, and thus we get a creative circularity between the whole and the part. And the crucial thing is that for Francisco Varela, this is also how the dynamics of the nervous system and the immune system works, okay? Now, once we have autonomous systems, autonomous units, these units will respond to the world in a non-neutral way. That is to say, their interaction with matter will matter to them. It will be literally a matter of death to them. In other words, autonomous units will always attempt to preserve their organization, their internal coherence, their dynamic equilibrium. And in this regard, according to Francisco Varela, they carve out a perspective they are not placed into their environment like a wallet is placed into a pocket, but they actively carve out a situation. They are embedded, actively embedded in their environment. That is why, according to Francisco Varela, the stimulus should not be understood as information, but rather as perturbation. So the stimuli are not external orders or rules, something that governs the organism from the outside, but more akin to a challenge or a question. That is to say, an opportunity for the organism to restructure itself, repattern itself, so that it can maintain its dynamic equilibrium. And this is related to what Francisco Varela means by inaction, because he says that an autonomous unit, by trying to maintain dynamically its internal coherent, it inacts enacts its environing world. It brings forth its Umwelt. It gives rise to its milieu. And this Umwelt, this milieu, is basically its domain of meaning, the domain of significance for that particular uh, organism. This is most nicely represented, not by the, the example that you all know, a bacterium uh, uh, swimming in its sucrose gradient, but by an example given by Conguilem in his work, The Normal and the Pathological. He says that if you do not, do not take into account the perspective of the living being, you are unable to account for a difference between a food and an excrement. Because from a chemical and physical chemical perspective, they can be identical. And in fact, a food for one organism can be the excrement of the other. So the only way to be able to understand this particular value or significance, the meaning of food or excrement, is by taking into account the perspective of the autonomous unit. So, in other words, the living beings do not engage with their world via representations, but via what Francisco Varela calls sense-making, or we could even say sense-birthing. So there is an active process where the organism constitutes itself and at the same time constitutes its world, which allows the organism to constitute itself. The crucial point being here is that we have a circularity between the living body understood as an autonomous unit and its environing world. So we have an ongoing dynamics between the living being which centers itself by decentering itself so going outside of itself and 
decentering itself by going within itself. So again, the crucial thing is the living beings is not externally governed, but is this particular relationship is circular or co-specifying. Again, we have an encroachment between internality and externality. Now, the same result we get if we start from the other position. If we don't start with life as living, so with living bodies, but with lived bodies. So the one way to think about this is that Francisco says that if we take our explorations seriously, what we've just said seriously, we are witnessing a funny type of flip. Why? Because this twofold circularity that we've just described is also true for us. So this encroachment that we've described in the example of the living beings, we also find in our own experience if we look into it. So only in our case, we don't only think it, we don't only conceptualize it, but we actually live it. It is the texture of our phenomenal reality. So we are, in fact, living this virtual circularity that I've just described, or we are enacting the inaction that I was just referring to. In other words, this could be perceived or characterized as follows. If when we are doing biological science, we are observing living bodies in their Umwelten, in their environing worlds, and we see that there is a circular relationship between them, we ourselves are also living bodies, yeah? But we live them, we, we, we live through them, and we are embedded in our own experiential world. So the same dynamics, the same circularity can be found here. And this is something that Francisco Varela was exploring in his later works, which unfortunately, due to his untimely death, remained fragmentary. So he was drawing on phenomenology, psychoanalysis, and historical epistemology, all of which showed that our field of consciousness, our phenomenal field, if we grasp it in its immediate lived aspect, is not, as is sometimes portrayed in the Cartesian picture, a self-enclosed, self-sufficient domain or sphere. This is only true if we take a very specific very abstract attitude to our experience. However, if we also take into account emotions, affects, moods, perception, motility, we see that we are not dealing in our experiential field with a pure consciousness that would be somehow severed from the world, but rather with something that is more similar to what Heidegger famously calls being in the world. Yeah, And this is why Francisco Varela emphasized that when we are studying experience, phenomenal field, we should, dis we should disenchant the abstract and re-enchant the concrete. Actually observe the experience as, as it is given. And if we do this, we will see that it is not something that would be severed from externality. Ex uh, externality. So again, also in our phenomenal field, we find a similar circularity where our lived body, the body that we live, is always anchored and embedded in its experiential world. And it can only have this world by being centered in itself, and it can be centered in itself by having a framework which allows it to do so. So again, we're not here dealing with something that would be self-enclosed, but we're having again, a relationship that is circular and co-specifying. Again, we are dealing with encroachment. In both of these cases, and this is the crucial thing before I wrap this up, is that we have, when we're talking about life, a dual motion. We have a centering that has to decenter itself, so to speak, and decentering that can only happen, happen via centering. So, the living being has to go within itself so that it can go outside of itself and it can be within itself only by going outside of itself. Yeah. So we have the external externality and internality intermeshing in the living phenomena. Okay, let me now wrap this up very briefly and point to some implications of this. We have said, first of all, the Francisco Varela if we want to understand notions such as embodiment and action and so on and so forth, we have to go back to the broader philosophical project within which they acquire their meaning. 
And this is something that is strongly related to Francisco Varela's um, uh, need or urge to transcend what I refer to here as Cartesianism, which is characterized by the bifurcation of or split between exteriority and interiority, between experience and the world. We have said that this, according to Francisco Varela, cannot be done directly by simply finding a solution, some sort of a conceptual uh, uh, solution or answer to the problem, but rather by a recontextualization, a development of, of a new ideational context, of a new thought style, a thought style that I refer to as the epistemology of participation, and which should be characterized not by bifurcation, but, but encroachment. So this interpenetration of exteriority and interiority. We have also said that for Francisco Varela, the hinge around which this particular transformation is to happen is the phenomenon of life. Why? Because of its Janus-faced and circular nature. So yeah, the phenomenon of life seems to be precisely the manifestation, the portrayal, the actualization of this encroachment that is needed. And it seems to, by its very nature, to transgress the boundaries of interiority and exteriority. Now, Francisco's goal was to find ways to explore this middle ground, to explore this middle domain, this vital domain. And for him, and this is very important, this was not just a theoretical endeavor. So he was not just trying to do what I was trying to do here today, where I was trying to conceptually articulate why life is important and how it feeds into the understanding of notions such as embodiment and inaction. For him, this, is a, this was a very, very practical endeavor as well. So especially in the last decade of his life, he was constantly trying to come up with concrete techniques and practic practices that would allow him to explore these two aspects of vitality. Um, and he would often talk about a dance as a metaphor for this, which is, again, a very dialectical, very embodied, very circular activity, uh, where the two partners are constantly kind of uh, um, engaged in this encroachment that I was referring to. One such attempt, one such attempt to develop a framework that would allow for the concrete e exploration of this is, of course, neurophenomenology. Uh, this according to Francisco Varela, a disciplined attempt to study uh, neurophenomenology and experience at the same time. So to have methods, rigorous, systematic, organized methods that would allow you to study both and then find ways to bring them together. So to basically put them together and try to initiate this particular gestalt switch through their interaction, through their engagement. And he was very eclectic when it came to this. So he was drawing from phenomenology, from various wisdom traditions, as you know, especially, especially Buddhism. Um, and he was exploring different avenues and paths. However, what is more important is that neuro, uh, neurophenomenology should be seen as part of a larger project that Francisco was interested in. And this is precisely what I was mentioning during my talk, namely the attempt to bring forth a different type of science, a science with a different face, a reflexive science, which would be characterized precisely by this ongoing circularity between knowing the scientific aspect and being or the experiential aspect. And the idea was precisely by bringing together on the one hand disciplines such as biology, cognitive science and so on and so forth, and phenomenology, hist history, historical epistemology, wisdom traditions, and rooting them rooting them, anchoring them in the phenomenon of life, that such a gestalt switch could occur. And this gestalt switch, mind you, would actually mean a dual transformation. So both science and experience would be seen different, differently. Science, the world of science, the world of nature, so to speak, would be seen not seen as a view from nowhere, but as a distinct form of existence or experience. So science would be seen as an activity anchored in life. Experience, in turn, would not be seen as an mute, inexpressible, private domain, 
but something that constantly strives towards articulation, to expression, to knowledge. Or in sum, the idea is to think about life, which is constantly trying to grasp and transcend itself in knowing, in science, and science as a way or mode of life. And to, to end with a quote uh, from one of the earlier uh, text by Francisco Varela, where this is nicely expressed. If we are to have an alternative understanding of mind, this knowledge, the new knowledge, has to balance with a corresponding being. So what we know is anchored in how we are, and how we are relates strongly to what and how we know. Translated, an expansion of experience, a redressing of balance between knowledge and being. I apologize for a slightly longer message, uh, lecture, um, and uh, yeah, this is where I finally stop. <laughs>